Hello, welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit about conflict transformation, exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures in a divided world. My name is Nuno da Silva. I'm one of the hosts of the summit, together with our colleague Eva Schoenfeld, who could not be with us today, and Ben Roberts, who is here. Hi, Ben. Hello. And we both have the pleasure to welcome today uh, with, to have a conversation with us, Lydia Violet Arutunian. I hope I say your name correctly. Yeah, that's good. Welcome, Lydia. It's great to Thank have you. you here for a, for a conversation. You have been studying uh, dedicatedly with deep, deep ecology with the elder and Buddhist scholar Joanna Macy for the past decade, learning how we can metabolize climate despair eco-anxiety and community traumas into energy for resilience, action and community healing. You are running a music as medicine project, a nonprofit dedicated to democratizing access to music education, Macy's work and cultural events as tools for cultivating resilient cultures in our communities. And you are also an accomplished Iranian-American multi-instrumentalist weaving together Southern blues, American roots, and Iranian folk music traditions. And I've listened a bit to your music, and I must say I really love it. So I hope we get, we get a bit of a sense of it today as a starter provocation. <laughs> but anyway, perhaps a good way to start our conversation is really to invite you, Lydia, to tell us a bit of your journey. How what has what has um what what kind of couple of events that shaped you in your way towards doing the work you do today in the world i love that question um you know i think that honestly my first kind of experience that i had that maybe without even words but with a sense of gravity drew me to people's pain for the world was just my childhood growing up with a father who really cares about people and 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 a mother as well but i think of my father because he was you know very much in the system of needing to drive an hour and a half to work every day and he had immigrated here from iran and with my mom and and just all these systemic things that he was stuck in while having this kind of big heart and i and the subsequent sadness and that i maybe in hindsight realized was so related to systemically to the situation it wasn't just his personal weakness or something it was on behalf of his empathy that he was a certain way and I think you know just growing up with him was kind of and and then me being a sensitive kid as well who wanted to help people out and you know was also pretty gregarious and always talking to people and trying to see what's going on and he was pretty shy and you know I guess that was like a good setup for um then when I met Joanna Macy, you know, my first year of grad school, and I was at the California Institute of Integral Studies in a program, I'd signed up for this program, a master's in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness. And I walk in the first week and I, ha I realize I don't know what I've done. I don't know what we're going to talk about. I just, I, I applied for this course because I, had a sense to and then I show up and I'm like what a, you know I'm a stagehand I'm a lighting technician yeah I've studied theater I've studied these different things but here I am in this philosophy and religion program whatever I'm there and you know my first semester Joanna Macy and Sean Kelly were teaching the great turning and it was very impactful for me the moment where Joanna was introducing the course and she simply named our pain for the world. And how that there was a, libera a liberatory effect, I think, that happened for me in that moment. That all of these things that were a personal issue, a personal problem, a personal sensitivity, were now liberated to be 
on behalf of solidarity with life. And in that moment, I cried so deeply and I was so self-conscious because it was my first day with all these people I didn't know in this class. And I'm sitting in the corner, I'm bawling my eyes out, trying to say, hi, my name's Lydia, you know, but it was normal in this context. And Joanna was obviously very uh, supportive in being able to facilitate my reclamation in that moment and then subsequently after. So that was very formative for me. And, you know, ever since then, I, I mean, I was obviously drawn to her. I was drawn to this work. I've gone on my own journey with it and now have ended up in a position where I care a lot about Joanna's body of work and helping to continue it in the world at a time where she's phasing out of facilitation. And, you know, we're kind of in the question of this, yeah, this phase of evolution with it. Thank you so much for, for <laughs> the brief story. I'm, I'm sure there's much more into it, but um, so much. Yeah, whole what, life. What, a, what a privilege to to get to get in, into academia and get getting in face to face with Joanna and yeah. Joanna's work. So I, I definitely resonate with with the, the feeling I'm hearing from you that if, if there's a group of people um very you know very intentionally moving her work forward as she's getting in a very elderly age and mm -hmm. uh, i hope she continues with us for a long time but mm -hmm. her, her work is really a blessing so i could you tell us a, a bit because partly partly we 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 want really to introduce the the, the people hearing us a bit of what is the work that reconnects and mm -hmm. so that would be mm -hmm. really helpful I think for many many people yeah you know I can give my perspective there's a whole ecosystem of perspectives which feels important to say but Joanna Macy is 91 she's a root teacher of this body of work called the work that reconnects she's also a, a scholar so she has many writings that she's done books that she's published but I'll speak to this body of work called the work that reconnects which in essence is a uh, you know, a group of teachings, group work exercises, meditations and stories that have been developed over the years when walking into groups of people and saying, how are you doing with what's happening in the world? Or how are we doing with what's happening in our communities? And I think that, um, you know, whenever you have a root teacher, you have their root influences, which in this body of work have been systems theory, which Joanna is a scholar of, deep ecology, which Joanna is a scholar of, Buddhism, which is Joanna is a, you know, has a deep relationship with, and, you know, there's many others as well, but those are some of the pillars of, you know, the work that reconnects but really, you know, in a really practical sense, I just see this body of work as Joanna observing, you know, there's something not being talked about here. There's burnout happening all over the place and realizing that there was maybe an unspoken, unspoken truths, unspoken emotional realities, unspoken relational realities, unspoken despair that was not actually helping us to not talk about. Um, and that that's one element and then that there is a way that a deep ecology, a systems lens actually helps to support us in movement work. And then I think just in life. And so she, she cared about that. So she developed this body of work, you know, it's been alive for about 40 years in its iterations. There's facilitators all over the world. And then I facilitate it, you know, like it's it's been facilitated on front lines in community organizing meetings in workshop and retreat settings um you know that's become a very popular thing but i think yeah there's there's it's it's a tool that i think can be used in like these different ways yeah and perhaps you can briefly talk a bit about the 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 steps or the different parts of the the spiral of the work that reconnects for people mm -hmm. to get a sense Mm -hmm. I think because they are all relevant in their own, uh, in mm -hmm. their own rightful place. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's do it. So the spiral of the work that reconnects, or what's become known as the spiral of the work that reconnects, is this trajectory, this kind of like, um, like path in a workshop that emerged that seemed to be helpful in the uncovering of a dialogue and supporting a dialogue around how can we speak truthfully to how we're doing about what's happening in the world, how can we share the load, how can we do this as a group in a way that seems to uh, be a helpful tool. And so there's this, this kind of like four part spiral of the work that reconnects, which, you know, as a group, you kind of do teachings and exercises in each part of this spiral. And so let's just do it. I'm going to draw it out. And so there's four main quadrants. And you start where many wisdom traditions have started for a long time. And we know this. We see this. And there's ways that you know, psychological neuroscience and things are catching up to this saying, you know, practicing uh, gratitude is supportive to our ability to withstand stress, to maintain balance in our nervous systems. There's so many different reasons to start with gratitude. And so here's a little, that's like the spiral. And we, so we start with gratitude. And one of my you know, I have to admit when I was learning about this body of work, I, you know, was ready for the juiciest, most helpful, radical tools for uh, being a warrior in the world. And then I was like, wait, gratitude? Like, I know that. Like, is that really that radical? And Joanna said, when you live in a political economy that wants you to feel needy and insufficient so you buy things that spends all that money to convince you on what you don't have to practice gratitude to know what you have within you and at your back is a subversive political act and i would add fundamental to psychological health in our time Yes, I would add one thing that that for me is really striking and perhaps you can speak a bit more about it, but is that in doing so in a way that is really, um, I would say, deeply conscious uh, means that we, we kind of acknowledge and start to really be more and more going deeper in layers of entanglement to how much we are entangled with the world around us to kind of still start to really be in a place of recognizing that we are only because we are somehow, which is this kind right. of idea of Africans of Ubuntu, right? So you kind of recognize everything on the back from your past, your ancestry, but also from the natural elements, different things in your life that somehow are offered to you. You didn't make anything to, to, to have them, you know, you, we take them from, for granted, but we didn't do anything to deserve them. They have right. just given. I mean, gift. imagine if every billboard every Google ad, every commercial that we interacted with said, meditate on the gifts of your ancestors. Meditate on the gifts of the land around you and what it gives you. Meditate on your own inner resources, gifts, and strengths. Meditate on, you know, you know what I mean? Like these are fundamental uh, community consciousness psychologies that we're just immersed in and and i think yeah this to say well we're gonna stop for a second and we're gonna consciously try and resist that and reclaim and claim access to health and well-being by meditating by starting with a resourcing practice of what am i grateful for what is it that i do have what are the resources I do have when I walk into any situation. So anyway, that's the first, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say exactly. That's the first, that's like the, the, the grounding, right? The, the foundation yeah. for then do the, then you can mm -hmm. start to get ready to do the work. <laughs> well, but that's the work. But that's too. the work already. That's the work. Sometimes I think we, you know, I, 
I'll just say I, I led a four-day retreat two summers ago, and Trump had been elected here in the United States. And, you know, I spent the whole first, an entire day on gratitude because we came in tired and people needed resourcing. So it's, it, there's this interesting thing where I think because of different cultural things like gratitude has become like this lightweight, airy fairy practice. Mm -hmm. But I think it actually needs to be reclaimed as like the radical practice that it can be, you know. All right, so we start with gratitude and then the second part of the spiral that we move into. So again, there's teachings and exercises around this is because when we talk about what we love, it can bring up what we're losing or it can bring up our, our, our pain is honoring our pain for the world. And that this, so there it is. So we start with gratitude and we go into honoring our pain for the world. And here is the, tr you know, more truth speaking. I mean, this is where we understand that it is okay to come out of isolation and it is okay to simply speak to and that there's intelligence and grace in speaking to what we see in the world that doesn't sit right with us and how we feel about that and that it's understandable to be overwhelmed and that it, we can learn, you know, I've, I've been saying a lot this last year when I'm teaching, how can we accurately understand what the medicine is if we're not willing to be with the wound and see the wound and hear the wound and, and grieve the wound and do whatever it is we need to do to understand the wound so we can understand what the medicine is. It's so great you're mentioning this because in a way, when we were talking to, as a preparation for the interview, we were talking about this thing of conflict resolution and management. And we live in a society where, yeah, a wound is, you have to fix it right away, right? You have to, or, or any kind of pain, take a pill and it will be, it will make you feel better. So it's all about fixing and, and really not understanding that all these palette of emotions of the difficult emotions that are part of being human are have their own function so i, I really find this part mm -hmm. of honoring the world of also allowing things to have their right place in our lives you know that we need to grieve for the loss and and particularly in this time where there's so much multiple dimensions of loss that we are experiencing right your, your story of, of coming into that class and, and you know, dissolving into tears, I think speaks so powerfully to the <laughs> need that's there, right? And, and um, I think the, the notion that Joanna developed the whole body work in part as a response to despair that she was seeing. And feeling. And, yeah, and feeling, right. And that, and that we're told, I mean, this, this mindset that we're, you know, that says take a pill says you can't go there right you'll you will melt into a puddle of tears you will never stop crying I, you know we have to fuck it up and be optimistic and we can't let people down by that whole mindset i think is you know it, this is so clearly an antidote to it's exhausting right <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and i'm curious you know in this historical moment too where where we're seeing a lot of hope you know, and Joanna, one of her books is Active Hope, we're co-authored, co and, and, and I'm curious how, you know, the mix, just, just like, personally, I, I have this sense, I, I don't want to get too caught up in the hope, um, mm -hmm. because I don't want to be set up for the despair on the other side of that, and so there's something underneath it, there's a deeper, more profound version of both despair and hope, I think, that she speaks to. Yeah, I mean... I think for me, they walk right alongside each other. I can't have one without the other because active hope is about doing, right? Active hope is about being a verb in the world. Active hope is about uh, informed action. And I think that, I think that There's, there's something that's so matter of fact about it that I think can actually be helpful and clarifying. 
where it's just natural. It's just completely natural to be disheartened or affected emotionally when you see people being murdered on the streets, when you see systemic oppression, when you see, you know, when you, when you understand the very real need for liberation, when you, it's, it's just perfectly natural for that, for that to come in right alongside the work that I am doing in the world. And I don't know, you know, initially when Joanna was doing workshops, they were called, it was called despair, from despair to empowerment. Well, she stopped calling it that because she realized there wasn't like a beginning and an end. You don't like start in despair and you end up in empowerment and now you're done. We are alive in a very vibrant world. We have been born into this time and it's simply part of my moral compass to be able to say, that's not right and I have feelings about that and that's okay. Right alongside, and I'm not gonna invisibilize the good healing work, the restorative work, the regenerative work that millions of people have been and are doing right now on the planet. They are right alongside each other. And I find that framework to be the most serving of me to be able to move through the world right now, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want me to keep going with the spiral? Yeah, let's, let's do it. I think the one last thing, maybe we already hit it, but I want to say about honoring our pain for the world is that if we cut off to it, we might cut off the fundamental information that we need to understand. I mean, this is so basic to the practice of solidarity is to be able to sit and listen and hear and believe and stay in the room to understand how to share the load, what peop, certain groups of people have, un, or the earth has unfairly been bearing in the realms of suffering, you know, and to, and to try and reconcile that as a community to try and heal that as a community. So we try and bring these things online. And it's not to say, so then we have infinite capacity to just always be in the room. It's like, no, I mean, self-care, nourishing ourselves. Part of what I think gratitude is, is recognizing it's a gift to be here at all. It's a mystery to be here at all. Do you know what's going on? I'd be surprised if you did. Because this is so mysterious to wake up here being a human being on planet Earth, right? And that can be important to, yeah, to have a relationship to that reality too, I think. So that's why I think gratitude and honoring our pain just so beautifully Intertwined, yeah. together. Yeah, and I, I, actually I want to speak out, I want, I want to speak out to, uh, about something related with this honoring the pain that is very dear to me and is somehow related with what's happening these days in the States. That is that, yeah, I, I was born and grew up in Portugal, we, who was once a, 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 co a colonizer, a, a world power, people traveled with the boats and I learned since I was a little kid in school that... Uh, we, we were the, the, the starters of the great travels and we discovered Brazil and some other parts of the world. And, 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 the, and the slaves part is like past, like Push very, to the yeah, to the side. I mean, we talk about it, but it's, it's, it's culturally embedded, the idea that we were the less bad. Uh, Portugal actually were quite good colonizers. And I think the, the, what, what for me was really, as I, as I grew up and start to mature in knowing and get, get reconciled with history, was a sense of um, how, you know, not, not going through the pains, not having the chance culturally to go through the pains of that history, get us stuck then in, in, in sorts of ways of thinking about the world today and of relating with each other that are problematic somehow mm -hmm. and and so for i really see clearly the function of the of, of the processing of pray, pain and give and grieving also from deeds from ancestors and i see that in my family in the, my, in the way i relate with the history of my father and, and other men in in my in, in my lineage 
And so this, this became something really important for me that is like, okay, this is a distant past, but the, to say this is out there in this not necessary, we should forget about that. Now we are in a different reality. Right. Uh, is not, is not really allowing us to, to kind of mature and learn with history and move forward, you know? So that and it's not true because the we that are in a different reality is only a certain group of people. Yeah, exactly. Whenever I hear the word we, I get little prickles on the back of my neck and I go, okay, which we are we talking about? You know? Definitely. The indigenous people in Brazil, <laughs> not necessarily. Right, right. And that, and that, and that, and that I want to acknowledge, like, we have empathic pain. We have personal pain. Like, it's, I don't. I don't think we've been educated, most of us in society, about how to emotionally withstand being present to the realities of what's happening on the planet that need to be reconciled. And it's okay to need to be educated in that. It's okay. I mean, this is part of why I've committed my life to the continuation of this work, to facilitating it wherever I'm invited to whoever wants to try and do this, because I think, you know, Brian Swim in class one time, he talked about how in the same way we can anthropomorphize the world, we can project human-like qualities onto more than human anything. He said the combination of scientific materialism and the industrial Re revolution led to a shadow in our consciousness where we mechanomorphize the world. We projected machine-like qualities onto everything. And when you do that to a human being, you negate that they have an internal landscape. You negate the reality of, you can use whatever word you want. You can use psyche, you can use soul, you can use spirit, consciousness. But to negate that reality has done us a great disservice. And so what I think part of why I'm drawn to do the work that I do, whether it's with music, whether it's with Joanna's work, whether it's with you know, cultural celebrations that celebrate the culture of marginalized communities is to be able to acknowledge the existence of internal landscapes and the needs of them because how do we keep going? We keep going when they're nourished. We keep going when they're supportive. We don't paralyze as much. We don't get lost in panic as much. We're in it together more. And I think that coming out of this mechanomorphized projection and reality is part of the work that we have to do right now, you know? I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you. I think we are we are the three in the in the in the same uh, line with that. So after after honoring so the pain me, in the world. Yeah. So that's the second part, and then then the third part of the spiral. And again, this is something that emerged from experience and and practice. Gratitude, honor, pain. Seeing with new eyes. I just saw something new, actually, that I really like. Seeing with ancient and new eyes. I'm going to say that. I like that. Seeing with ancient and new eyes. Because there's this, there's a lot of language right now. I love Brian Swim, but I do think that the 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 word, the new cosmology is problematic, right? And whenever I see the word new, I'm kind of like, mm, eh, mm, mm, you know, but, but I, I think it's just nuanced. And so seeing with ancient and new eyes, I think is about the oftentimes, I think Joanna observed, I've observed, many people have observed when we do that work of honoring our pain, there can be a re-entry into a sense of, of, of reunion with the web of life, a sense of reunion with our ecological self, a sense of reunion with a more community identity. And that seeing with new eyes is about, I think coming out of the, the separate isolated self and acknowledging that we feel these things we, because we care about what happens beyond to ourselves, but beyond ourselves. And that is perfectly natural in an ecosystem that is suffering to feel pain, to feel these things, and 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 then to um, you know to uh, to have an awakening to both the suffering that's systemic 
and the healing that you are simply a part of that is systemic. I think a lot of people, they wake up to what's happening in the world and then all of a sudden feel the weight of the world on their shoulders. And I think it's because we don't help support and educate people into a sense of self where they understand all of the good works in the world are also, you're, you're a torch in the middle of that, you know? Like there's yeah. a lot that's happening at the same time and you share that identity. And I was thinking, well, the, the, because I mean, all this work in, and again, we are just giving um, different stages for something that actually it's, it's moving and like all the life is always moving. But one of, one of the, and one of the things that comes for me is like, if you do the work of gratitude and honoring the pain, you know, in a profound way, so we recognize that this entanglement that we are, that there's no separation. So we kind of dilute that, that illusion of, of, or start diluting that illusion of, of separation. So I think when you get to seeing with new eyes, there's an invitation to stop looking to the world in this analytical mode, which in a way is the mode you were saying, Lydia, of the machine, right? To see everything in parts and understand life in a, in a very compartmentalized way. So Though, there's, there, I don't know if that, there's something you can talk about this other way of seeing because I, I have yeah. my own ideas, but maybe, maybe there's something you can give some hints because yeah. I do think it's not only a, a, a reclaiming of ancient traditions and new age thinking that's, that's like, it's far away from that is really a, a opening up to other possibilities of understanding of, of seeing and understanding the world. And I wonder like if you could give some hints on yeah. And what is the invitation there? So I think what I hear you speaking to, and I just want to honor that Joanna's a scholar, right? So she's down with brain food, as she calls it. And I love it too, as part of why I'm drawn to her work. But I think what you're talking about is really the last 300 years, 400 years of trajectory of the evolution of the Western way of of analyzing what's true, what's not, what's real, what's not. And that there, you know, it's a, it's a long thing to try and make succinct, but there is a teaching in the body of the work that reconnects that talks about how we've seemed to evolve in a way. And when I say we, I mean the culture that I grew up in, the Western way of acknowledging what's real and what's not where we seem to think we can exit the earth and maintain some kind of objective eye that then looks down on reality and analyzes it in a mechanomorphic way to figure out what's real and what's not. And so Joanna will draw it like this. You know, it's really, here's the earth. Here's either some way that we, one of my biggest epiphanies in grad school was that objectivity is subjectivity. It's just a different kind because we're humans, we can't really get away from subjectivity. But anyway, and that part of, I think, what you're talking about this other way is a, an, any experience that kind of moves us from being separate from the earth you know, to I am the earth feeling all of these things on behalf of her community. I am, I am a part of, right? I am a part of, I'm not set. There's nothing I can do to sever myself from the body of earth. I am earth lydia -ing. I am earth playing music to herself. I am music asking how do we heal in this time? I am earth trying to be in solidarity with parts of her that are suffering. I am earth from, you know, the body of lands called Iran and Armenia. I, like I am. And that, that is not to be underestimated as such a fundamental shift in identity from where we can end up, which is like a human that's separate from the earth and there's all this, you know, there's all this separation. And it's like, I respect myself as a part of the body of earth, which I love and I care about what happens. I love that. And, and, and I was thinking that it's also this thing of, 
you know, you cannot understand the whole, like you cannot understand the a whole of what is a person or a community or a place or the planet as, 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 as an entity by describing its parts or by making this analytical process of understanding each part and then bringing it to a whole. There's, there's another gesture of thinking and it's good you mentioned subjective because often what I'm going to say is put aside as non-scientific and so non-trustworthy information, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about imagination and intuition of how when we are connected in that place of really being tuned with what's, what we are experiencing, we kind of get a sense of the whole that, it, that we are, but also the whole of which we are part of or the different worlds of which we are part of in a different way which is not like, and so that's what also a bit of what I was saying, that for me it fits a lot in this stage mm. of, of seeing with new eyes. is opening up really to kind of hearing each other because it's a lot about like working in collectively. It's not like you're just going to have mm. to figure out things by yourself. It's by having deep, deep, deep listening and dialogue and opening up by the gratitude and the honoring the pain that we start to get in that place where we can sense things from a different place. That's... And I think it ends up with what you're saying somehow. Maybe there's a place here in, in identity that ties into an experience of conflict. Because I think that oftentimes in movement spaces or, or just in life in general, like, again, they're right alongside each other. There are individuals, cultures, communities, animals, leaves on a tree that are absolutely unique and individual unto themselves. I do not need to deny that reality. I can see it. And all of those parts are fundamentally interconnected with each other because we all woke up here. And I think that it's like, you know, just even like that an environmentalist needs to look and sound a certain way in order to be considered an environmentalist. There's so many different ways to care about each other, to care about ourselves, to thrive. And maybe part of when conflict arises, I mean, I think there's many reasons why conflict arises, but maybe one of the things that I see that I would like us to evolve out of is like, you have to look a certain way, you have to sound a certain way, you have to write to like be considered a part of the environmental movement or the regenerative movement or whatever it is. And that it's like, I don't know, there's something in there for me about, about like, yes, we're all connected. Yes, we're all in this together. And there's a billion different iterations of earth on the planet right now. Some of them were hurting each other and the planet some of them and like it's all systemic and we're all trying to figure out what healing not all of us but a lot of us what healing looks like together and I don't want to cancel someone's original identity in order to do that if that makes sense this is why I love Adrienne Marie Brown and Emergent Strategy so much because I feel like it's so able to articulate the balance of individuality and the whole, which I want very much without whitewashing individuality and without losing sight of the whole, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And, and I, I just wanted to add one thing that is uh, kind of emerging for me or that, that has been central in a bit of my reflections related with identity is how because of what you are saying of, of these expectations and this kind of in in group thinking of of you know of, of familiarity and that many of us get stuck uh, in in um, s uh, fixed rigid perspectives of identity and do not acknowledge that actually we are because of all we have said until now that we are always also I'm always being undone and redone and, you know, because <laughs> so it's all true. movement, you know, it's not like, 
It's not like I can say just because I'm called Nuno, I'm the same guy throughout my life. I've been That's changing so a lot. When I talk with some people like that I meet that don't have a curiosity to see where I am, I like like dude, what where are you in your understanding of life? Because the first thing I do when I meet someone is how you are, what's going on with you? Because it's a different person I'm meeting, although mm. it's familiar in many ways, right? Yeah, it's so true. We're like it's the mechanomorphizing thing again too. It's <laughs> yeah. like we're not dead noun machines. We're living verbs. I am the earth, Lydia Ing, right? Like, and there's certain ways that I'm the same as when I was two years old, and there's certain ways that I'm pretty different than when I was two years old. Um, should I finish this spiral? Yeah, ben, so now, do you want to say something? We are seeing with new eyes what to do. Ben, please. What's up, Ben? Yeah, well, it's we have a storm moving in, and Good. <laughs> as you're speaking, Mother Earth is saying, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a machine. Aww. Yeah. Nope. I, I love the word mechanomorphizing too. I, I know. I don't even know if he remembers he said it. I feel like it was one of these one off yeah. genius things he said. It just it seems I mean, I, and I think we do that with conflicts, right? And and so that's part of the new eyes, seeing with new eyes to say no, if we're if we're alive, living, evolving verbs completely interconnected with you know a larger whole that is also that we're not a machine you know when a when machine has a problem it's broken and you fix it there's some part that needs mm. to be removed right and mm. and that's it, the the mindset of being living beings inside of living systems completely transforms that i i, I started watching this documentary on hbo um notes from the field Anna Devere Smith it's sort of part documentary but part performance by her and there's this one beautiful piece she, she portrays all these different characters but I think she actually interviews the people and then she and then she speaks their words and one of them is a, a Yurok native fisherman um, from, northern, from northern what's now northern California who has gotten into all kinds of trouble with the law and first you hear his story, which is just like unbelievable tragedy. And yet somehow he's risen above it, um, you know, through the whole prison industrial complex, school to prison pipeline, et cetera. And then you see a, an elder, a Yurok elder talking to him. And he's like, he's out in the world now. He's got a business. He's trying to, you know, deal with things and, and it isn't easy. And he's having trouble. And the elder says, you know, when you're in trouble, I don't want you going away. I want you to come closer when, you know, when we're in conflict, when there's, when you're angry at me, I want you to come closer. And and that to me is sort of the opposite of how we deal with the machine when it's broken. We get rid of the broken part. We replace it with something else. And um, yeah, so all of that's just sort of mm. stirring mm -hmm. up as the, mm -hmm. as the wind whips outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. All right. The, so the last part of the spiral. So we've got gratitude seeing with new new ancient eyes. Um, is called going forth so here we are starting with gratitude going into honoring our pain seeing with new eyes going forth going forth so much i think is about connecting to our agency in the world connecting to our intention that carries us through no matter what's going on connecting within the workshop to out to beyond the workshop. I mean, how many people feel so good within the workshop and then we get outside the workshop and we crash. Right. And, um, to me, what I focus on with going forth is the relationship between intention, power, and uncertainty. And that, uh, I think we, many of us grow up in a culture where power and predictability are so intertwined, but, one of the things that Joanna teaches are the gifts of uncertainty and that what is happening right now in our world, in our communities, the future is just feels can feel really hard to nail down. And Joanna says, don't trust anyone who tells you we're going to make it out of this. And don't trust anyone who tells you we're not because we live on that edge of uncertainty and that one of the gifts of that uncertainty is that it can release and clarify our deepest intention that no matter what happens, no matter what situation we're in, 
And for me, I find power in that. So I have a clarity that whatever I wake up to in the world, my intention is to bring, you know, kindness, listening, grace, my own, if I have any gifts, you know, that seem like they could be helpful, that doesn't change. That, that, and that has given me something to rest into while I live in this incredibly chaotic moment where we don't know what's going to happen even on any given day. Look at what's happened in the last three months. Look at what's happened. Let alone the last 500 years, right? And we, and we wake up to that and, but, but we, I, you know, Joanna teaches about the, the power of intention. And again, I think that's one of those things that maybe got a little lightweight, but it's actually radical. It's radical to have something you can keep coming home to that you know about yourself, that you know about how you want to approach any situation in the world, your intention, right? Whether it's a specific thing you want to carry out or something that's more just like a way of being like I described. And so there's exercises and teachings and going forth to help empower that. And so, I think an intention is like a compass, right? Which yeah. can be really helpful right now. I, 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 was, I was going to say something else that is a bit polemic, but uh, I will say it anyway. But it's, What does it's, polemic mean? Uh, it's like, um, um, how the, the right word in English would be, uh, is that, that uh, in a way, polemic means, uh, it's a Portuguese word actually that I put in English. So it, it means something it. that might be, uh, have uh, a lot of uh, opinions in favor and against. So something that okay, is not got it. Like the opposite of consensual. Okay. Right? Okay. So, and, and is this, this idea, and for me it relates a lot with intention, is that when you connect with, when, when I connect with my intention and you connect with your intention, and if we can connect with a common intention, we create a field. So there's this kind of invisible thread that, that, that um, is is already part of the work. It's not like, and I think challenges a bit the idea of activism that that to do change, to work with to for change, you need to to do a lot of action. So the idea is, we actually we are we are we are not succeeding as activists because we don't we are not doing enough, which I think is is a, a, a very wrong a big a big misperception or. A, Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering, perhaps as the last question for us to explore is, then what, what is, how can we use this work or what is the relevance of this work for the topic of the summit, for conflict? And mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very open question and perhaps mm -hmm. for, even for the three of us to, to share a bit of what, what we feel after going through the, the spiral and the different elements. Well, you know a lot more, I think, about the central intentions and work of the summit. I mean, when I read a, and I think about the relationship between conflict and the work that reconnects and, you know, I just simply think about the ability to stay and listen. The ability to, yeah, stay and listen, to hear uncomfortable truths, to understand that it's not maybe necessarily just someone's personal problem, but that, you know, we speak things on behalf of the whole. And there's also balance there too, you know, because I don't know, it's just, it's such a both and, you know? I, I think it creates the conditions, you know, if you, if you listen carefully, if you see yourself as part of the, the system intertwined with others, if you welcome uncertainty, um, if you're willing to be there with the pain, then you know, it's the denial of so much of that that creates really destructive forms of conflict, I think. And this sort of, you know, like, like the pattern you were naming, Nunu, of, of, you know, activists thinking the problem is they're not doing enough and, and then burning out and, and, you know, a destructive form of despair. All the, and, and conflict, you know, that's just a, 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 a 
breeding ground for really destructive kinds of conflict and mm -hmm. you know and for people not taking care of themselves as well and and what this offers is a is a beautiful antidote to that right to to resource and nourish yourself and and the group together by naming the stuff that's most real and and that we're afraid to say together um to me it's uh then from there you know sure there's still conflict but it but it, it is a transformed space it, it's it's transformational medicine so I, I was also yeah. thinking like if you go through if you go through the, the four different stages in a conflict situation imagine you are in a conflict with someone else and you and you're invited to think like okay what are we grateful for you know in this situation because people person have the, the the two persons will have an history you're not going to have a conflict with someone you don't know it's uh, we could have on a social societal scale but on an interpersonal scale no so so then you can honor the pain like with what each one of us is feeling and really and it's truth to us and then start to see like how this inform us about the situation because i'm sure that if we go through that process you start to see some things with new eyes that maybe what you were caught the dynamic you were caught is informing you, in you about mm -hmm. something else that is in, at stake in the relationship that is calling for attention right and then you can move forward in a different place, you know, because you've been informed by this journey together of, of leaning in on the situation, mm -hmm. leaning in on what each one is experiencing in the relationship so that you can then uh, allow it to, to shift. So that, that Yeah, was I think very... that's right on. Yeah. I wonder if you have a short story from all of your work in the front lines and with so many different groups of where where the work that reconnects and other things that you do with music. It, Come on, you know, Lydia, one last energy. thing. Give us one thing. About a story about about conflict? You have yeah. to choose either a story or a music. <laughs> or how conflict, how, the, how the, the, the attitude towards conflict was transformed because of the ways that, that the space was held. Yeah, I mean, I could see that. You know, I think that I have been learning a lot from I have been more intentionally going into the south of the United States to facilitate the work that reconnects and I think that I have learned a lot about um, just the the pain that can be there around poor conflict transformation violent addressing of conflict a fear of conflict because it led to violence so many times and not to say that that isn't alive in many communities but it is something that i'm noticing like as like a particular maybe a thing that i keep we keep seeming to come back to in in those workshops and um that i mean simply that there is trauma there and in a moment when that core trauma for the group seems to come up to, to stop, to speak to it, to ask what is needed, to come in, you know, to go outside, to shake, to sing, right? To sing together, to regulate the nervous system, for it to be understandable, to be overwhelmed, for it to normalize something needing healing, you know, and, and, to, and to really try and ask to both facilitate and lead, but also to try and do that in a way where the healing comes from the group too, because then it's, it's just authentic. You know, you know about this wound. So what is, what do you think the medicine is for this? And I've had, you know, I don't, I don't want to name any specific retreats or workshops because we're talking about sensitive material, but I think that I've just, I had experiences with groups where we get to the dicey thing that this community is facing, one of the dicier things that that can come up for this community. And then we go, okay, let's listen. Let's notice what's happening in our bodies. Let's really go for some healing here and see what that looks like. And yeah, music, I mean, there's a reason why I've started combining music with my facilitation and facilitating community singing with my facilitation because music has been helping us resource 
for a very, very long time. And I, I guess I just, you know, it, I'm grateful for it as a tool to be able to weave in because it just seems to be, I see you, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of like what song feels, um, <clears throat> there's two songs that come to mind. I mean, there's a song that I've been singing the last couple of weeks by a song leader named Melanie Damore, who a, a lot of folks know. And she wrote this song, I believe it's called Standing Stone. And uh, I believe she wrote it for someone who passed away. But there's, a, there's three parts, but I just know the melody line. And it's very simple, but I think can, you know, is empowering for groups of people to learn together. So I'll sing it. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you. I will be your standing stone. I will stand by you. Thank you so much, Lydia. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the beautiful conversation. I really loved. I know you pushed yourself a bit. So <laughs> deep gratitude for taking the, the energy to be with us. And really, Thank you. I think I extend that from everybody who's going to be listening to our conversation. Thank you. For and, being... and, and folks could know you can look up Music as Medicine Project. Just so you know, look it up. We have online support groups. We have yeah. lots of The link is going there. to be just down from the video, so just just follow it, okay? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, both of you, Thanks, for being here. Honor to be here.